wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We trusted our time together in God's Word. We prove a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us out of His Word. If you're a regular viewer of our, of our study together, you know this is a Bible study program. Our, our purpose here is not to uh, provide entertainment. Uh, we're not here to be singing and dancing and, and having a jolly good time. Uh, this, isn't a, it, this is not a hootenanny time. This is a Bible study time. We're, we're interested in teaching and studying and learning God's Word. This, we, we, we're not here to promote a denominational system or doctrine. Uh, we're not trying to get you to join something. We don't have a philosophy to promote and, and to try to get you to in, uh, be involved. And we're not just simply here to, to repeat what the Bible is presumed to teach. You know, everybody that talks about Jesus and everybody that talks about the Bible are not talking about the, Bible, the God of the Bible, the Jesus of the Bible, and what the Bible actually says. There's a lot of stuff people think the Bible says that it doesn't say. A lot of stuff it does say that people don't even know it says. So we're not, we're not trying to just talk about what is presumed to teach and, and to, to uh, communicate the, quote, historical Christian position. We want to be Bible believers. In fact, historically, among Bible believers, there, there's a group of people in Acts chapter 17 called Bereans. Uh, the people that lived at Berea were more, were more noble than those that lived at Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scripture daily to see whether those, those things were so. Real spiritual nobility has nothing to do with denominational associations. It has nothing to do with uh, the ability to attract and hold people into your organization. Gain is not godliness. It has to do, though, with receiving God's Word, listening and hearing and understanding what God's Word says, and then searching to see. Don't take it from me. Search and see. That's the Berean attitude, and that's where real spiritual nobility comes from. One of the great topics uh, that uh, it comes up when you hear and, and, and listen to people uh, talk about Christianity, it's a, it's a claim that's often heard. It's seldom closely examined, and when you do examine it, you discover it ain't so, McGee. And that's the, that's the claim that the church began on the day of Pentecost. That's almost a universally accepted uh, statement in evangelicalism, that the church, the body of Christ, that God is forming today in the dispensation of grace, had its birthday on the day of Pentecost. Can I tell you that the church, the body of Christ, of which you and I are part today, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit takes you out of Adam and puts you into His Son. And when He does that, He makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus, and He creates you as a member of the church, the body of Christ. You don't get a choice about what church you join. God puts you in it. And the Spirit of God baptizes you into the body of Christ, the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, that is not the church that was involved in the day of Pentecost. I remember years ago, I was talking to a, a, a fellow in a, a, in a Bible conference, and uh, he had, I'd been teaching, and there was a, a whole group of preachers gathered around me. I was in the middle, and there was a circle around me. <laughs> and this one brother, he, um, he says, Well, Brother Jordan, we believe the church was birthed at Pentecost. <laughs> and um, that's a commonly held idea, but it doesn't make any difference how many people hold it. It just isn't what the Scripture says. I want to give you 12 reasons. Don't take my word for it. Look into it yourself. Now, the reason this is important is because if you don't understand what the church, the body of Christ is, you're not going to understand who you are. And you're going to be spending your Christian life trying to be somebody that you aren't and never enjoying the identity that you really have in Christ Jesus. It's important. Now, if you're hooked up to a denomination, 
And uh, you, you, your denomination, maybe it gets its name from the, from the day of Pentecost, and maybe it, it gets its practices, uh, uh, tongue-talking practices, or the water baptism ceremonies, or the uh, various uh, communal living things. On, on the, and, and there's things you want. Listen, you're welcome to have anything you want. Start right with me. You, you have my permission, as though you needed it, to believe anything you want to believe. But when you start saying, I want to go by the Bible... Speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible's silent, and just have the Bible as my authority. Now you've got my attention. Because what the Bible says about the day of Pentecost indicates clearly, I'm going to give you 12 points, if I can get to it and get through it in this time period, that demonstrate without any question that Pentecost has nothing to do with what God's doing today. If you look at Acts chapter 2, the very, the very last verse, Acts chapter 2, uh, start in verse 41. The first thing you need to notice about Pentecost is that there already is a church in existence on the day of Pentecost. A church doesn't begin to, doesn't come into existence on the day of Pentecost. There already is a church in existence on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 verse 41, when they that gladly, then they that gladly received his, that's Peter's word, were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there was a group of people there that Peter was the leader of, and they had 3,000 people added to them. The group's already there, and these, these 3,000 of the Pentecost are added to it. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice the church is already there, and these people, the 3,000, and then after that others, are added to a church that's already in existence. Nothing began on the day of Pentecost. The church that, was on, that is there on the day of Pentecost already existed. Number two, Acts chapter 2, verse number 17. Not only did nothing new begin on the day of Pentecost... The day of Pentecost was not the first, the beginning of anything. It's the last of something. Acts 2, verse 17, verse 16. Peter says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, underline it, in the last days. This is not the beginning days. This is not the, the first day of anything. This is the last days of God's program with the nation Israel. Nothing, again, began on the day of Pentecost. What's going on on Pentecost is a continuation of something that was already there. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter number 2. Now, hang on to your Bible. Hang on to your seats. Read your Bible. You let your Bible be your authority. Here's two verses right here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that if you'll let these verses make a difference in your life, they'll flat do it. They'll change things in your life. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape? Now, the book of Hebrews is written to... See, you're learning. Hebrews. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now watch. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. That's our, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He began to preach this, this salvation. And was confirmed unto us... By them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs, wonders, and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. This information began to be preached by Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then it was confirmed to the Hebrews by those who were preaching in the early Acts period under the ministry of the Holy Spirit who comes on the day of Pentecost. So first it began to be spoke by the Lord, then it's confirmed in the early Acts period. Nothing began in Acts 2. It's simply the continuation of what Christ had been teaching them in His earthly ministry. Number two, nothing new began on the day of Pentecost. It's the continuation of something that's already there. Number three, the day of Pentecost is in reality a Jewish feast day. Now think about that. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4 calls uh, the, the, the keeping of the law and the, and the days of the law the weak and beggarly elements. 
For you to go back to a Jewish feast day, according to Galatians 4, is to go back to the weak and beggarly, powerless, poverty-stricken system. There's no power for you in a Jewish feast day. Colossians 2, verse number 16. Colossians 2, 16, Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect to an holy day or the new moon of Sabbath days. Nobody is to judge you, Paul says, in respect to holy days. The day of Pentecost, Leviticus 23, go back and read it yourself, is a holy day, a feast day in Israel. Deuteronomy 16, 16, every man, every male Israeli was required to go to Jerusalem three times a year by God in a religious festival and a religious pilgrimage. You know, you hear about the Muslims having a pilgrimage to Mecca. They stole that from Israel. God told the Jews they were to go, the, the male Israelis were to go to Jerusalem three times a year. The first was Passover. The second was Pentecost. The third was Tabernacles. It's a Jewish feast day given in the law of Moses for Israel to observe. It's not anything new. It's the continuation of what God already was doing with them. And it's involved in their last days, not the first days of anything. Number three, number four, Romans chapter number 11 and Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, the nation Israel was not set aside. The dispensation of grace, the, the basic characteristic in this regard, in the dispensation of grace is that the salvation of God today is going to the Gentiles through the fall of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse number 11, Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. It's through the fall of Israel that salvation goes to the Gentiles today. You don't get to God today through the nation Israel and through blessing Israel and through exalting Israel and Israel's program. You get to God through the fall of Israel, not Israel's rise into kingdom glory. You don't get into Israel today by being Israel. On the day of Pentecost, Israel was still the issue. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, Ye men of Judea. Who is that? Well, that's Israel. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know... The Gentiles who would have been in Jerusalem at that time, for example, Roman soldiers, heard Peter talking three times. He says, I'm talking to the men of Judea, the men of Israel, the house of Israel. The Gentiles knew they were not being addressed on the day of Pentecost. The nation Israel was still the channel through whom God was dealing. Israel hadn't fallen basic characteristic of the dispensation of grace and in the but now time period is that the, the, through the fall of Israel, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. By the way, Galatians chapter number 3. In Galatians chapter 3, there was an entirely different kind of standing than is, than is available in the body of Christ. Galatians 3 verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. You see, in the, in the body of Christ, God did away with the status of being a Jew and being a Gentile. You ever heard anybody say, well, you got saved and you're a spiritual Jew? Now, what kind of nonsense is that? That makes about as much sense as putting a sock on a chicken's foot. You get, you get saved, you become a spiritual Jew. In Christ, in the body of Christ, there is neither Jew or Gentile. So you become a spiritual Jew, but in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. You see, in the body of Christ, you lose your former status connected to Adam, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, and you get the one new man, the new creature status. Well, if you're put into a spiritual unit of believers in which there is no Jew or Gentile status, you can't be made a spiritual Jew. You say, well, I don't see that, Brother Rick. Well, then uncover your eyes. And you can get it. You see, sometimes you can't read a verse and understand a verse because you're more interested in trying to make the verse fit your religious system when your religious system doesn't fit the verse. You say, yeah, but Brother Rick, that's going to... I." I didn't ask you about what it's going to do to you. 
I don't know. I don't know anything about you. Whatever it does to you, it'll do to you. It's done to others too. Did it to me before it did it to you. The issue isn't what it does to. The issue is prove all things, hold fast that which is good. On the day of Pentecost, if you go back to the book of Leviticus, uh, come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There were two loaves of bread that were used on the feast day. Two loaves. First Corinthians chapter, people say, well, that's the Jews and the Gentiles. But you see, that's exactly backwards because 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, for we, the body of Christ, being many, are one bread and one body. The body of Christ is not represented by two loaves of bread. It's represented as one. Where you lose the distinction between the Jew and the distinction between the Gentile and become one in Christ Jesus. So even the symbolism associated with the Jewish feast day of Pentecost doesn't fit what's going on with us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. There's a different baptism on the day of Pentecost. Come with me back to Acts chapter 1. You know, one of the, the reason that people give for saying that Pentecost is us is that Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came. And there's the Spirit baptism. And people say, well, we have the Spirit baptism. But you know, that's just not true. I'm sorry. It doesn't fit the verses. Watch the verses. On the day of Pentecost, you have a baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to call that spirit baptism, you can call it that, but that's not what the verse calls it. See, that's a religious term used to confuse the issue because when the issue is not confused, it doesn't let you teach what you want to teach. I, I know I said it. And I'm trying to be nasty to you. But somebody needs to put it waist high, slow pitch, right across the plate. Well, you can knock it out of the park if you want to. Now, you can bat the air and swing at it and strike out. That's your business, too. But we're not throwing you, throwing you curve balls or fast balls or spit balls or in shoots or out shoots or knuckle balls that you can't hit. We're trying to put one, just lob it right in there, okay? So there's no such thing as spirit baptism in the Bible. At Pentecost, you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. Jesus is talking to his apostles, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Not spirit baptism, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now you say, Brother Rick, why do you make such a deal about that? Well, hold your hand here and come back and look at what John told him. Mark, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. In that verse, you're going to be, he says you are being baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's not hard to get. The Holy Ghost is being put on them. Acts 2, it says he poured out his spirit upon them. Now the question is, who's doing the baptizing? Who baptized them with the Holy Ghost? Matthew 3, verse 11. I, John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with, it, with water into repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to, to bear. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. He Jesus Christ shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So in Acts chapter number 1 and 2, who is it that's going to baptize these people with the Holy Ghost? Right, you got it, Matthew 3.11. Jesus Christ will baptize them with the Holy Spirit. That's what happens on the day of Pentecost according to the text. Now, that is not what happens to you and me when we trust Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 1 Corinthians 12, and you notice verse 27, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. He's talking now, not to Israel, but to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 13. 
For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now notice that. Who's doing the baptizing here? By one Spirit are we baptized into the body of Christ. Did you see that? On the day of Pentecost, it's by the Lord Jesus Christ that they are baptized with the Holy Ghost. In the body of Christ, it's by the Holy Spirit we are baptized into the body of Christ. Different baptizers, different administrators, different the whole thing's different. Somebody says, but Brother Rick the Greek says, listen, don't fall for that kind of stuff. As soon as you do this stuff, well, the Greek says, you don't read Greek. I do. So where well, you got to go to find out what Greek says? you got to come to me. Anytime a preacher makes you come to him to get the truth of God's Word, you know what you just did? You just set you up a religious system to run your life. That's why we tell you, you need to get you a King James Bible. For 400 years, that, that King James Bible has been the standard Bible of the world. And if you can't teach the doctrine out of it, you need to throw the doctrine out. For 400 years, God's people have recognized it to be the Word of God. They may have argued about what it, what it, what, what it said and what it taught, but they knew it was the Word of God. You don't need some fellow coming along in your day in this day of itching ears, you're going to let somebody change your Bible? I think not. Now somebody says, well, you know, it's, re it's really the same word in Greek. You know what? That's such a silly thing. I can read. I don't even know anything about what the Greek said. I can read when it says Jesus is going to baptize some people with the Holy Ghost. I can read that and I know that isn't the same as the Holy Spirit baptizing people into Christ. Now, a six-year-old kid that hadn't got out of, that, that didn't graduate kindergarten yet can get that. You say, but my preacher says, well, maybe your preacher is educated beyond his means and capacity. You don't need a, a college education. You don't need no Greek and Hebrew. You don't need to go to seminary to get that. You just need to be able to read your King James Bible and then believe what it says when it contradicts people you didn't want it to contradict. Okay? I still love you. I know you might be squirming a little bit. Hang on. Ten more minutes, somebody else will be on here, and you can go back to singing and dancing. But we're talking about the Bible right now. Listen, the day of Pentecost is not what God's doing today. Everything about it is different. Go back to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, verse number 16. The day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of prophecy. Acts 2, 16, Peter says, This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Then he quotes, when Peter is explaining, he's filled with the Spirit, speaking the Spirit gave him utterance, and he's explaining what the Holy Spirit thinks he's doing on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit through Peter says, This which you see here is exactly what Joel talked about in Joel chapter 2. Verse number 33 Therefore, Peter says, being, being, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received the, of, the, of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. Pentecost is the fulfillment of the promise that the Father made to the Son, and it's all through the Old Testament about how that's going to be associated with the establishing of the new covenant and the kingdom for the nation of Israel. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. You know in chapter 3, Peter says in, in chapter 3, verse 21, that what he's talking about is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Well, that's in direct contrast to what Paul says later on in Romans 16, 25, that he's preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Paul says when he talks about the body of Christ, it's, it's a mystery which was not made known to the sons of men until it's now revealed by Jesus Christ to him and through him to the other holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The, the apostles on the day of Pentecost didn't know the secret because it hadn't been revealed by Christ to Paul so he could reveal it to them yet. Now my time's gone. And I've got three more reasons here that I can't get to. Let me just say to you this. The body of Christ began with the ministry of the apostle Paul, not the day of Pentecost. If you come to 1 Timothy chapter number 1, here's the verse you were looking for a minute ago, scrambling around trying to think of. 1 Timothy 1, verse 16. 
Paul say, he says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. There's the first person in the body of Christ. It's not Pentecost, it's Paul. And those that believe on him after Paul, those who would hereafter believe, believe according to the pattern, not that God set on the day of Pentecost, but that he set through the ministry that Christ from heaven communicated to the Apostle Paul, that ministry of long-suffering and grace that you read about in Romans to Philemon, where God set aside the nation Israel and set aside the laws and the performances and the ordinance and all the religion, and he offers to Jew, Gentile, bond free, big ones, little ones, anyone who will trust his son, everlasting life, as a free gift. The day of Pentecost, Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Paul later on says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's two different messages. And the reason it's two different messages and two different programs is because it's two different dispensations. And you're not, at, you're not at Pentecost. That's not your program. Listen, quit trying to torment yourself to think God isn't being as good to you as you thought he ought to have been by not giving you all that stuff. And come over here and, and trust God's grace to you through the Apostle Paul and understand he's made you complete in his son. Bless you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The moment you trusted Christ, gave you everything he ever has for you. And all you've got to do is have your faith rest in an intelligent understanding of who God has made you. Get free of the religious shackles and trust who God has made you in His Son, and see that bring forth joy and victory in your life for His glory. Well, we got to go. Thanks for being with us. God's best. Maranatha. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have an audio CD we would like you to have to go along with today's study. It's yours free of charge. It's our way of saying thank you for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal. If you simply write us here at The Message of Grace, the address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you may also call us at regular business hours, toll free, 888-535-2300. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If our study together has been a help to you, we would be happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. And then I cry, what wonderful grace.